tell us those really interesting little bits about how this came about and why, what, what, all those sort of things. So you'll get plenty of opportunity to ask about as well. And, and then uh, a short reading from the novels. And the reason for that is to try to give you some sense of what the, what the works are about, what they're like, and, and then we'll move into a much more general discussion, which is uh, uh, certainly less structured. Um, and as I said, there's plenty of time for questions. Anyway. So, um, is there a logic to a starting point here? Then? Don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the most organised person. No, that's right. So, so then if you, if you could just tell us a little bit about um, those, those sort of features and little snippets about how the novel came about, um, what, 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 what led to it, what motivated it, how the thing started, and then I might ask you a few more questions about <coughs> the nature of the work itself, just so people have a sense of it. So can we start with that? Sure, Richard. Um, yeah. Well, about 10 years ago, I, uh, I inherited a, um, a trunk full of family memorabilia and uh, there was um, various items in there, but the things that caught my attention were uh, photos of um, my grandparents getting married during the First World War, uh, a week before my grandfather left for Egypt as uh, part of the 10th Light Horse. And uh, there was also a uh, photos of my parents getting married during the Second World War. Um, and there was this sort of this, to me, a link of um, wives uh, with their husbands going off to war, the wives waiting behind and the husbands going off to war. And I, I just found it terribly sad. Um, what I also uh, saw in there was my grandmother's wedding dress or part of it. and. Uh, also, um, a piece of her hair. Um, this is just amazing, really. Um, and you could hardly call it a, a, a memento or um, hardly call it memorabilia. It's part of her DNA, it's part of her body. And uh, it became a very um, potent, moving, emotional trigger, I think. And so these things, the photos, um, letters, uh, less cards, the trunk itself, the plat, uh, all became, I think, uh, metaphors uh, or props um, in, the, in the novel. Um, and I think I did this sort of consciously and unconsciously. Um, and the other thing that I borrowed, uh, I sort of borrowed that idea, I guess. I didn't, I didn't the story's fiction, but I actually used them in a, in a, um, I, I, I used them in a fictional way. I didn't use the real items. If you, Get what I mean, mm. um, but uh, uh, I think that the other thing that I borrowed was um, the name Grasswood, um, and I used that uh, for one of my settings. It's a fictional setting in the in the southwest, and um, it could be sort of anywhere east east of here, um, over towards uh, near where I grew up. Um, but I borrowed this name Grasswood for for the setting which covers two thirds of the novel. And the other setting is Perth. Um, but the real Grasswood was um, a place, uh, it was a family property. My great grandfather pioneered it, and then um, my grandfather, he sold it after the First World War. My grandfather bought it back as a soldier settlement. And um, so it was where my grandfather grew up, it was where my mother grew up as an only child. And it was where my parents first lived at the um, when they married in 1940, um, and it was where my mother lived with my two eldest brothers while my father was away in New Guinea. And so this sort of this family uh, sort of generational thing of three generations, and this this idea of um, this grass wood. Uh, and the name appealed to me because I thought, you know, it sounds sort of very romantic, lush and green, but in summer it would have been pretty dry and bare. So that idea appeal, appealed to me, and also the idea of um, the, the connotations of grass widows. Um, it sounds very like grass widows, grass, grass widows. And so that idea, um, it, it struck me. And because um, that's what would have been the case with my mother and my grandmother, they would have actually been grass widows while their 
um, husbands were away. Well, certainly the uh, so, setting yeah. of Grasper comes alive very much in the novel. We do feel as if this is very familiar territory to whoever's writing about it. It's a great sense of authenticity. I think. You mentioned that there are three generations in the uh, real world, if we can put it that way. Uh, there's also three generations in the fictional world. Yes. Could you just say briefly a little bit about that? about who those characters are and yeah, sure. the time um, period So uh, it, it's set between 1945, um, last year of the Second World War, and 1965 um, is when it ends. And um, it shifts about in time as well as setting. So it starts off in uh, Perth as a short prologue, um, and uh, then it, it shifts uh, back to Grasswood and then um, two-thirds of the novel then comes back to Perth. But basically it revolves around about <coughs> around a, uh, a character, an absent character called Jasper, who's um, an RAAF um, Lancaster bomber pilot and he's gone missing um, over occupied territory. Um, and uh, really the story is about how his absence um, affects the women he leaves behind. His, his mother, and this is where the generational thing comes in, his mother, Audrey, his uh, twin sister, Attie, who takes over the running of the farm while he's away, and uh, his English war bride wife, who comes out to, to uh, ahead of him uh, to await his um, demobilisation, and um, his young daughter, Virginia, who uh, is a baby at the time, but she ends up becoming a character. So in a sense, it's, it, uh, re it revolves around the three voices of Valerie, Attie, his twin sister, and um, young Virginia. And we sort of see this coming of age of, of her. Wonderful. Um, could you give us a sample of that now, give a short reading from the novel? Yes, yes, I will do that. <coughs> the part that um, I'm going to read you is actually um, from Atty, um, and it's taken from the last year of the war, 1945, and uh, and some of you might sort of recognise the the countryside. Um, and also, just before before I start, it's just to give a little bit more context. She's she's sort of. Um, She's daydreaming. Um, she's she's going about the the things that she normally does, day to day things. But she's sort of wandering off in her memories, and she's thinking to her childhood in um, Salon, uh, where she grew up. She came to Australia when she was eighteen, and uh, she's she's sort of thinking about that, and she's um, she's thinking about her twin brother Jasper. Um, and it's been five years since she saw him last. And, and she's really thinking, uh, well, anyway, we'll get to it. So I'll, I'll start now. Sometimes in the evening, when the southwesterly had died down, the three of them sat on the veranda, waiting for the sun to set. A mob of kangaroos from the state forest often came lolloping across the paddocks to graze down near the water. Addie picked up the binoculars. Bally pest, she complained. Beautifully unique, so damn destructive. She'd been brought up surrounded by wildlife in Salon. Monkeys, squirrels and mongooses. As a child, she spent hours watching them eating in the jackfruit trees or skittering across the veranda roof. They were delightful little creatures, she remembered, but her mother loathed them with a vengeance because they piddled and they stank. Even monkeys, she warned, but disease-ridden, vicious little sods. As a lad, Jasper might have teased them now and then <clears throat> with his sling. Often he'd, he would call, call out to come and look at a mangoose which had a snake pinned down by its neck. They're all valley pests for that matter. But you didn't destroy them. You left them alone and they left you alone as well. Hattie watched now as the sun slid further into the forest and the darkening colours of the paddocks began merging into one. The kangaroos must have slipped away without her even noticing. She peered again. No, they were still there, their grey outlines almost absorbed into the colour of the earth. They stopped nibbling, paused, 
Ben sniffed the air and stared at her. A shotgun would do the trick, had been Cam Carter's advice. Yet Addie had never been one for guns. Back in Salon, she'd always avoided the deer and leopard hunts when she was a girl. She'd have a go at most things, but not guns. She couldn't see the sense. Some years ago, she'd asked Cam to come over and put old Troy down. The Clydesdale was sick and getting on, poor devil. He'd done all the hard work for them, pulling out stumps, helping clear the land and eating fruit. They bought him soon after they arrived. Twenty pounds from Smiley's Bazaar, Jasper had boasted with a grin. The horse had been sent down by train and she remembered her brother walking him home from the siding. Troy had served them well. Even now, Attie was saddened by the memory of his death. She'd watched Cam quietly leading him by a halter up into the state forest with the rifle tucked under his arm. It was as if the useless animal felt her shame too as he plodded, head down and back to the weather. She knew the exact spot where that horse had died. Last November, when she'd taken Audrey walking to look for wildflowers, she had accidentally come across his bones scattered in a clearing. They were half hidden beneath a flurry of spider orchids, which Audrey was clamouring to pick. The conspicuousness of their long, white, streaky petals and red tongues had camouflaged the broken carcass and a glimpse of metal in the sand. Atty stooped to salvage to salvage one of the horseshoes. She started shivering uncontrollably as she spotted the black hole in the animal's skull. Had he supposed guns were a necessary evil? These days, just Jasper's guns were locked securely in the closet, thank God. They were all there, 12-gauge shotgun along with the 303, the 22 rifle, boxes of bullets and cartridges, the works. <coughs> she pictured a brother cleaning the guns as he had on a number of occasions over sheets of newspaper spread out on the kitchen table, oiling the barrels and paying meticulous attention to the breech and bolt. Sometimes he'd go over to the damn duck shooting with his cartridge belt slung low on his hip. She'd accompanied him only once, against her will. It's quite simple, really, it's said, holding up the shotgun. Here, just watch. He pressed the release, then broke it open with a crack, loaded in two cartridges and snapped it shut with an air of resolution. He raised it, packing the butt firmly into his shoulder, closed his left eye and lowered his other gradually down towards the sight. Standing before him, Atty followed the waving barrels of the gun as he tracked his target in the graying light. She plugged her fingers in her ears, heart thumping against her ribs as she waited for that deafening sound to come. Bang! Then the after rings of its echo in her ears, and all around the lingering smell of shot. Her father rarely spoke about the war. Once, when they were children, Charlie instructed them to always treat their ponies kindly. A man was nothing without his horse. A horse was a friend who could save your life. During the war, her father said, fellow cavalrymen had shot their injured horses for fresh meat. How could they do it, Dad? She'd asked him at the time. Oh, that's nothing, Jasper had piped up cheerily. The French eat horse meat every day. Jasper, Charlie had smiled gently. Well, maybe if you had fully beef for months on end, I kept, you might do it too. He didn't tell them that the horses were dying or that when you've killed a man, putting an animal out of its misery becomes a relatively easy thing to do. She'd only found that out recently when she'd come across his blood-stained pocket diary, a war memento that had fallen out of the bundle of old letters Audrey had been poring over. But he wondered how many people Jasper had killed since he'd been away. Flight Lieutenant Jasper Partridge couldn't say what operations he was on, not even what sort of aircraft he flew. Bomber Command, Valerie had intimated. Possibly Wickerton, where they met. But these days, even she was in the dark. All Attie knew was that he was one of the Brill Cream boys, the elite. They're all basically an educated bunch, according to Jasmine. Sportsmen, prefects, school captains, that sort of thing. After all, he said a pilot had to be a leader. 
had he thought of Jasper often, his five-year absence. She missed her brother more than she would ever have imagined. Poor Jasper. It came out little more than a whisper. Yes, said Audrey. Our darling Jasper. Let's let's hope it's not too long before he comes home and takes over from where he left off, she said with a sigh. And you, my dear, can start looking for a husband. Like a hole in the head, muttered Addy. There, she'd said it. And she was glad, if only to annoy a mother. But within seconds she regretted her words, for in her mind she could still see the black hole in the horse's skull. Excellent, very much. Is it no, it's not on. Okay. Um, thank you, Lynn. That was beautiful. That's really beautiful. Um, my novel is called Letters to the End of Love, and with that kind of title, you think it had something to do with letter writing, and it's three sets of love letters. And we begin in 1969 in Ireland, and a Russian painter is walking his dog. And the scene shifts to contemporary Perth, and a woman is <coughs> writing to her partner of 15 years, wondering if their relationship is, is going to survive. And then we should back in time to 1948, and an English doctor in Bournemouth who's retired is writing to his lover who died during the war. And the whole thing began with a dream that I had. And I was actually contemplating giving up writing because it was just driving me crazy, to be honest. And I wasn't going anywhere. And I thought, no, 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 I should have been an accountant. Um, and I had a dream. I had a dream about a man diving. And it was one of those images that it's still with me. It was like this beautiful sign of 1930s matinee idol diver, and he just kept diving in the, all these different complicated styles, just on and on and on, and never actually reached either the water or the bottom of anything. And I woke up and I went, okay, what was that about? And I, I, I pursued it, and eventually from that image came the idea for the book, um, which began with the born of Dr. John Carpenter, and diving reoccurs through all three strands. So it was really that genesis that kind of pushed me forward into the book. And at some point I realised that what I wanted to talk about was love and intimacy, but not in that way where a novel will take you on the chase, you know, it'll take you on the on the on the road to, you know, whether the relationship is going going to going to work, whether people are going to get together, kind of you know, pride and prejudice, sense and sensibility, that kind of thing. I wanted to know what happens afterwards. You know, after the people are together, what what is the blood and bones of intimacy actually like? And I wanted to talk about that. So I thought that love letters was an obvious way to do that. Um, but in each set of of love letters, there's something at stake. Something is driving these people to write these letters. So in the first set of letters, which are between Dimitri and Kathleen, Dimitri is in his 60s, he has a heart condition. And he doesn't know how long he's got to live. He could have three months, he could have three years. And he's a Russian immigrant. He managed to escape um, Russia during just before the Stalin's purges. And he's been in Ireland now for, well, between Ireland and London for about 30-odd 30, 30 years. And he's, um, he's trying to finish this painting, this white painting, which is massive. It's, his, like, it's the last thing he wants to do. And his wife asks him to write the letters <coughs> because they've got 40 years of marriage, the end is approaching, and there are things that haven't, they're not resolved and, and they need to be unpacked. So that's the reason for those letters. And then when we move to Perth, there's a um, lesbian relationship it's Grace and Weeks. And then Grace is a bookseller, uh, fairly old fashioned. Might have some resemblance to me, but you know, just me. Just, yeah. um, Louise is like a, a, a PA to a um, sort of 
someone who's like a cross between Johnny Depp and Bob Dylan. Like he's he's more famous than anybody, and she has this crazy lifestyle. She has to run around after him all over the planet. So Louise is away, and Grace says, "I want to write you letters." I mean, they can email and text and everything, um, but they decide that they're going to write these letters, and Grace wants to do it because there's something about the slowing down of time in letters and the ability to contemplate things. And so they start this correspondence. And then when we shift back to Bournemouth in 1948, John is, as I said, a retired doctor. And he begins to write these letters, which are unsent letters, to his lover David, who was a, a, another painter, a Bauhaus student, um, who was obsessed with Paul Clay, who ends up um, perishing in a concentration camp. And John is writing these letters. He really doesn't know why, but really he's doing it because he's desperate. And he has no one to talk to about this. There's no way for him to process what has happened, so he needs to do this somehow. So he starts to talk to David through these letters. And it's recollection as well as you know the possibility of a future for him maybe. But you know, it's a working out of grief, basically. Um, yeah, so that is, in a nutshell, what the book is about. <laughs> That's really fascinating. Um, but I'm still none the wiser as to how come you um, have written this particular book of those sorts of settings, that interest in Europe, the interest in the time period, interest in Russia and Germany, the Holocaust, and so on. It's a very it's beautifully detailed and so on. It's obviously, it seems to be material that you have a great familiarity with. I did in the end, yeah. <laughs> I'm very, as a writer, I'm, char I'm character driven. So the, the characters appeared, and I was like, oh Lord, do you really think I'm qualified to do this? So John appeared first, and literally the first image was he's sitting at his, he's got his old student desk, you know, and he's, he's like six foot eight or something, this guy. He's really tall, and he's at this little desk, and he's writing these letters. And in that first moment, I knew who he was writing to and why. And I was like, no, 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 you've got the wrong writer, surely. So there, there was a, it's a kind of in, in, in honour of those characters, really. I mean, there must be some fascination for me as well in those, in those periods. But there was something about, I think, about the ethos of the book. It's about how does art temper suffering? That's really the question. And I wanted to look at significant moments in the 20th century. So you look at the Gulag and you look at, at the Holocaust and say, well, how does how does art not not explain this, or but how does it how does it talk to us in a way? So, so this wasn't a, a product of your reading as an adolescent or something. You weren't fascinated by this period or reading the diary of Anne Frank or something that seems to have disturbed a lot of people for generations. <laughs> uh, so there's nothing that's easily Grass in terms of this particular interest, it was just you had to you had to do the work on it. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't. It's not one particular thing at all, really. Apart from reading Souls and Mitzvah when I was fourteen, which is odd, really odd. But apart from that, it's just a, a genuine interest in the people who appeared. So yeah. yeah. So you're bound to them, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's my lot. <laughs> Yes, if you can short reading, that would sure. be lovely. I was just going to try and give a little reading from each, just to give you an idea. Um, so we begin with the, um, the Irish letters it's in County Cork, and Dimitri's gone to Cork with Kathleen, and she's bought tea, and he's kind of hanging around, and he sees in a um, shop window the White Album, which he doesn't know, I mean, he knows it's a record, obviously, but he's fascinated by it because it's purely white and he's working on this white painting. So he goes in and he buys a copy of the white album and he takes it back and he works in his greenhouse and um, his dog is in the book called the, the Notorious Dog. You never know what he's notorious for, but he's just notorious. Um, and he likes the goon show. So when um, Dimitri puts the white album on, he's not really very happy about this. So I'll just read a little bit about um, a little bit from the first letter. So um, this is Dimitri and the dog in the greenhouse with the white album. Today the rock and roll made the notorious dog so very unhappy. 
The guitars were no louder than any Shostakovich symphony, but I could tell the dog would have preferred an orchestra. His instincts glued him to the greenhouse floor, but his ears clicked back towards the door in some irritation. So I talked to him in the old language, not the modern dialectic, but in the poetry of Novosibirsk, my sparse, cold words hiding warm, lush language. And he replied to me in his looping way, rolling the sounds around his throat until they spilt out of the cage of his mouth, wet and sweet like birdsong. I thought these musicians would be modern young men, but it is not so. There was retrospection. I didn't expect this. I listened to their lamenting guitars and their simple, sentimental piano. I think, though I can't know it, that the dog liked the song about the weeping guitar. He stopped grinding his teeth while it played. I believe it could be my favourite as well. When the first song I finished and didn't change over, the dog thumped his tail in happiness. I asked him to fetch the palette knife from the workbench. It was time for us to work. My painting. I lifted one corner of my working canvas off the ground in an act of pure superstition. I shook it to settle the thousand shades of white I had placed there so many months before. Painting it is the art of spies. It is a code that everyone can see, but none can decipher. In this wall of canvas, there was all white. The huge painting wanted so much to have colour, but no, there would only be white. White guards on white horses in a northern snow so snowstorm, the very same sad old comedy. The dog nudged the pellet knife into my hand. He walked the length of the canvas once, then lay down in front of the radiogram. The blood rushed to my hands. I shadow boxed in front of the canvas. I lunged. It was not so difficult today. Rhythm invaded me and I cut new marks, chipped out old tracks of thought and the layers of white that walked down the centre of the painting. The white vertebrae I'd constructed over months of work, a spine as thick as the trunk of a young pine tree. And I wished it were colder for me so I could work better. But the painting, it needed all the warmth it could get, all the warmth I could gather in the old greenhouse, which after Michael's summer labour is now snug and warm. After an hour or so of paint, True to form and on its own, the radiogram crackled to life once again. Notorious dog shifted into a better listening position. The last of the smoking sagoons began. Took a step back from the painting to look. Strange signatures floated across the spine of the painting. In all the white, nothing was certain. Goons exploded in the air. That's Dimitri. I've got to ask you about the goons while I get a moment. There's various motifs run through this novel that just more and more you get more and more layers and more and more intrigued. I mean, but the goons are one of them, they seem to keep, they once stay to put one and keep popping up. Yeah, I think it's that relationship. There's a there's an old saying about uh, the goons and the Beatles and how the spirit of the goons moved from the goons to the Beatles to Monty Python. So I wanted to just play around with that a little bit. And if I had the Beatles, I felt like I needed to have the goons. And actually, the dog just expressed a preference for the goons. Right. So, yeah. And it, it, again, it's more about the kind of comic end of the art. And there's a, all, there was also, in my own weird mind, a relationship between the, the anarchy of the goons and the anarchy of the Beatles and the anarchy of some of the early 20th century Russian literature, which I, which I really enjoyed. So. And I think I'll just read one more piece, which is um, from the Bournemouth Letters. And this is uh, John Carpenter, who's the doctor, and he's writing to David, and it's his lover. Um, this is from the first letter. And the first letter is very much made up of remembrance when I first met you. you know. So he's, in, he's invited David to come and play tennis. So this is the, the kind of... Preliminary first date, you can have such a thing when you're queer in the 1920s, you probably can't, but it's a kind of a date anyway. Uh, okay, so this is John. He says, I do have one photograph that I keep in the bottom drawer of my bedroom chest. It's wrapped in my tennis jumper. In the photograph, you're alone in the garden, sitting on an old white wrought iron chair surrounded by the tropical plants my grandmother had put in just before the first war. Great South American things with cooling green leaves the size of platters. Your back is jammed up against the back of the chair. Your feet are resting on a small tea chest and you're smoking. Your cigarette is in your left hand, which is resting on your thigh. Be careful not to flick ash on your tennis trousers. Mine, you had to borrow them to play that first afternoon as you had none of your own. 
You are spinning a tennis racket on its head by flicking the hand with the thumb and two fingers of your right hand. You are not looking at the camera, you are looking out into the space where the tennis court would be. You are thinking that you'd much rather be back in Berlin painting than playing tennis in Bournemouth with people you hardly know, but there is me and I am strangely compelling. Vivian took this photograph of you, but I can tell by your studied casualness that you knew it would be given to me. Mrs. Halligan is in the kitchen doing the washing up. I offered to help her, but she gave me such a look and made a hasty retreat. The sun is pushing through the mid-morning bloom like Leslie Howard to a London crowd. Vivian fled down the zigzag along West Cliff, West Cliff Prom to the pier approach baths to do her lengths. When she returns, she'll insist I get up and go for a walk. But whatever the weather, have a cup of tea, something useful. Not just collapse on the, on the sitting room settee and stare at the ceiling, looking at the universe in an RW Edis inlay. She doesn't seem to understand there is nothing left to fall apart. I'm like a man who continues to live in his house once the walls have collapsed. Which would be funny if I were Keating or Chapman. Ironic if I were Cap Kafka or Brett, but I'm just a doctor with no sense of humor. This was something you always appreciated about me. You found it refreshing that I didn't try to be clever. I didn't even try to make you laugh. I just offered to tell you the time. In my old working life before we met, I glanced at my watch at half past five in the morning, every morning, and travelled to Bart's. I could be relied upon to be back at Crawford House at a quarter to seven in the evening, weather and trains permitting. I would then be available for regular updates on the time and the occasional conversation until a quarter to eleven, when more often than not, I would go to bed. Some nights I wake up with a violent start, my heart in a frenzy and I believe that I am dead, that I've woken up from life and I'm lying in some celestial waiting room. Then I hear your long gene ticking on the nightstand and I know with sickening absolute truth that I'm still alive, moving forward in time, leaving you behind. Thank you very much. It's really, really, really nice of to listen to these works being read. They certainly come alive in different ways. Well, 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 they're in our mind. I'll just ask both of you about this question of the, the voices in the in the work in the novels. Um, in fact, maybe we begin with you because it's such a complex sort of issue. In your case, you've got three sets of letters. You've got five voices, I guess, in all. Um, was it very difficult to sort of get those established and distinguished and so on and so on? It was incredibly difficult, actually. Um, and the first thing I needed to do was get the stories down. So I finessed the voices towards the end of the, of the work because I really needed to know what they wanted to tell me and because I, I didn't know, I don't, I'm not the kind of writer that knows what's going to happen. I have to, you know, get the story down. Um, and there's a certain rhythm. Rhythm is very important to me, so there's a certain rhythm I had to, I had to establish with each voice. But then Beyond that, there had to be just a little bit of an idiosyncratic kind of tone for each of them. So I didn't, because it was first person and, and because it's first person addressing their intimate other, I didn't, I didn't want to make them sound like a caricature of themselves, if that makes sense, or because they're not from, I'm not from their particular time, I didn't want them to sound like, you know, a kind of Hollywood movie or something. So there was, I just wanted to do just, a few little things to differentiate them from it, from one another. Yeah, it, 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 it seems to work remarkably well. Just, just while we're on this, and I'll, otherwise I forget what I want to ask you about for the doc. So obviously the letters are being written to an immediate audience in the sense that they're addressed to a particular person, but at the same time they're in a sense addressed to the reader. And I guess the challenge there is not to make the reader feel like they're an onlooker and, and, and the reader sort of excluded from it because we're sort of voyeuristically, you know, reading letters between people that we've come across. So, so uh, you seem to succeed remarkably well, but I just wonder whether that too was a major issue in terms of the writing of the work. Yeah, it, it was a problem. I, I kind of deliberately avoided that thing that can happen with, you know, you, you write in shorthand to the people you love, you know, and, and there's a whole lot of, there's in-jokes and, and there's, you know, things that only they know. And I avoided them to a, to a larger extent because I never wanted to lose sight of the fact that I was writing a novel. 
and 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 that these characters were going to tell you know first they were going to tell their beloved things that they already knew you know partly for the benefit of the fact that this was a novel and <laughs> that the reader needed to know stuff and it's kind of like okay, how do I justify that and that was the the reasoning behind um, wanting them all to be a kind of forensic examination of, of a relationship over a long period of time so you could go back and forth. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so, so it There's was a sort of a meditative feel to quite a bit of it, isn't there? Yeah. They're, they're sort of thinking aloud as yeah. well as anything else. Yeah. Then for you, was it very difficult getting the, the, the voice? Um, I don't... The voices, I shouldn't really say. No, I don't think it was actually. Um, no, I think, I think I could sort of hear them in my head. Um, I think maybe Virginia's was a little bit harder because that's the coming of age and trying to get a child's voice, mm -hmm. hearing a child's voice. Um, I think initially I actually wrote that in the um, present tense, um, sort of give it more immediacy and then um, I realised it wasn't working when I had this, this sort of backstory of 1945. Uh, it just didn't quite work, and and then I thought that I could probably present the memories um, better. I could present facts and information better as sort of memories, this daydreaming aspect. Um, and uh, so I think so. I got out of the present tense, and um, but I think Atties and Valerie's. I think I could hear. Um, I think I probably. Yeah. Were they, were they, uh, Based on anyone, is that what you <laughs> But were they, no, I wasn't going to ask you. I can, but. Um, was it always third person? Uh, no. The, the, um, it started off um, he, with uh, Virginia in first person. And then I think I realised that I had these other characters. Um, yeah, initially it started with Virginia, and I wasn't sure where it was going. Right. Um, but I knew there was a backstory, but I wasn't quite sure what the backstory was. And um, so I realised it would be, work better in third person and uh, in the past uh, tense. So. Yeah, yeah. um, let's uh, go get into one of those really big and nutty and wonderful questions uh, about notions of love and sexuality, which both I think both novels are, are deeply concerned with this question of love. Um, in, in, in Yvette's novel, Kathleen says to Dimitri at one point, it is almost impossible to write about love. Um, but then, of course, we then proceed to do just that in many ways. It, it seems to me that the notion of desire runs through both works very powerfully and also the way desire works through the notion of absence. So the letters, of course, are written to someone who's not there. But on the other hand, there's also key characters who are not there. In the case of John, I don't think it's really too much about the novel, is it, to say that David, who he's writing to, is not there. A character, Grace, has a brother, brother Patrick, who is dead. Dimitri has a brother, Victor, who is dead. There's a child of Dimitri and Kathleen, if I'm not misreading that, who has died. There are various absent figures throughout. And of course, in the case of Finding Jasper, the title itself is indicative of that. Jasper is the sort of absent centre of the work in many ways. So I'm just wondering about notions of desire and absence and how you see those uh, functioning in the works. Uh, I don't know where we can start here. <laughs> this, is, okay. this is huge, but we'll, we'll make a start. Um, when I read Lynn's novel, it was oh, the, one of the first, once I finished the novel, it was one of the first things that struck me was that for both of our books, they're both built on the on the absence of a, a huge figure in the in the lives of the characters, and it's like Jasper's like a shadow throughout throughout your novel, and it works so powerfully and beautifully. It's very difficult to do, I think, and I, I found it incredibly difficult. But it was another reason why I went for the letters because it seemed a way to to start to address those things. But um, in terms of the relationship between John and David, I think one of the reasons John begins to write is because the, the, he, David may be dead, but the relationship continues for him. So psychically and emotionally, that relationship is still 
continuing and he needs to acknowledge that but he also needs to try and find a way out. And maybe because he's a doctor he's not going to go and get analysed, he's not interested in analysis. And there's a running joke about his sister leading an old friend's card around the house which John just burns every night, which he finds very cathartic, but he's not going to go and get analysed. But part of part of that desire, I think, is 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 um, kind of addressed through the writing. But um, the, the relationship between desire and absence, kind of, it, it's pivotal to all three stories. And it's not just about romantic desire either. It's about the, it's just about the love of of the other, whether it's a brother or a lover or the dog even. Um, I, wanted, I wanted to kind of infuse the novel with um, compassion really, compassion for the people who are closest to you perhaps as opposed to compassion for strangers but what, what does that compassion look like? Um, how does it manifest? And that I don't know, desire gets a, again, you know, in, in, in the kind of novel where things are all about passion and about chasing that desire, it almost makes it like a, a kind of cartoon version of desire or something. It, 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 it makes it, it, it makes for drama and it makes for comedy. Um, There's a sort of a great irony that Center of this, isn't it? Because the, the very thing you desire is that which is absent. So, in a sense, it can never be met. And if it is met, of course, desire, desire dissipates or disappears. Yeah. So it's almost like a recipe for saying, look, if you want, if you want to be in the state of desire, you've got to make sure that this, whatever the object is or whatever, never arrives. So, <laughs> where, where does that? Put this? I think it's just a, it's a, it's a play, isn't it? It's, a, it's the and going from one to the other. I think that's what I want to talk about. I think Lynn does that very well as well. Yeah, then we can move to Jasper. <laughs> oh, um, this one. You're hearing me? Of course not. Is that better? Yeah. Um, well, um, look, I, I did you know a lot of research for this novel, and um, I researched war brides and I researched, um, you know, grief and mothers who had lost sons. And, you know, I, I read about stories about um, mothers who had lost three sons, not one, but three. And, you know, how do you get over that grief? I, I read about um, war brides who um, arrived out here and all their troubles that they had uh, when they arrived. and. Um, one of the things was actually competing with the mother and the other siblings for this sort of right to love um, because they're all waiting for this loved one to come home and so it often it created enormous friction and hopefully that's what I, I managed to portray in the, in the novel but it created enormous fiction, uh, friction and um, there, there was always this, these competing loves, um, and, uh, and it's one of the things that, that war does. It, it just um, it creates havocs in, it, in families. Do you think it sort of just exacerbates or exaggerates the sort of dynamics that exist even without war? You know, people do compete, don't they? Well, they do compete, but I mean, if someone hasn't hasn't been around for five years or three or four, I mean it. And I think there's one uh, there's one scene in here where um, I think Valerie is daydreaming that Jasper's come home, and and she's thinking, well, what would he think of me? He hasn't seen me for ages. What would he think? And you know, who would he embrace first? Would he embrace his mum? Would he embrace his twin sister? Or would he embrace her? And this 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 feeling that uh, I, I think it's it's definitely um, you know made. Far more. Um, yeah. Far more. Yes. Magnified. Magnified. Yes. Yeah. Both of you mentioned the role of research in your work. I mean, how, could you just touch on that briefly? Um, well, research. Uh, this was. Uh, I don't think it's. 
specifically say that um, this was part of a PhD. Uh, this novel was. Cre um, we did say that. No, we didn't help. Well, uh, nothing to do. I think. <laughs> Someone. Anyway, yeah, I think. <laughs> anyway, so, um, but there was an enormous amount of research there. Um, as I said, you know, I, I researched war brides. I researched. Um, I researched the whole of the first or second world war. And so much information. Did I didn't know what to yeah, do. Yeah, I was wondering about that. So the, and, it, and it got me the, to, you know, the point where actually I had. Sort of writer's block. I think I knew too much, knew and too I much. couldn't. Yeah, 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 but I couldn't work out what to use. But yeah. um, one of the very helpful things was um, uh, the archive, the um, BBC archives, um, because I was able to get sort of um, all the the news from the various days. What you know, like the bombing of Preston and so on. The, the, Actual accounts, mm. and um, and you know, with uh, eyewitness accounts of things. Um, so I did a lot of online research and archives, and um, and you know, there's the research that you you do, which is not really books. It's research that you do through your memory, I suppose. Mm. That's sort of unconscious, um, unconscious research that you do. You know, you're trolling through. Your, your memories, and uh, you think, oh yeah, I, I sort of remember so and so saying so such so, and so. such. Somehow, you know, with these weird writer brains, we have they make connections, and suddenly something says up there, that's a good idea. We'll put that such or such, tuck that away somewhere, or you know, make a note of that. That could be used. So yeah. um, it's what happens all the time. So there's this sort of trolling through your memories, I guess. Um, yep. Mm -hmm. Did you find you were swamped by all the stuff you did? Oh yeah, the same problem as Lynn, I think. Um, Stalinist Russia, World War II, uh, the Holocaust, and within that gay men in the Holocaust. Um, yeah, the, the Irish Revolution. I mean, I was just everywhere. I just, <laughs> I had to stop. So I, at some point, I just decided to go for the lit go for the literature at the time and do enough of the kind of cheap, you know, bread and cheese facts, <laughs> but also go for the literature that was written. Um, I had a five-year in-bar relationship with a scholar in Berlin for the um, John and David um, letters to make sure that what I was what I was saying was correct within the bounds of what people knew, which isn't much in terms of gay men. Um, and even the things I wasn't saying, if that makes any sense at all, the stuff that's hidden underneath it because I don't go into it in explicit detail. Um, but yeah, there was a lot. It's a whole bookcase and a half of, of things. And I went travelling as well. I went to Ireland for a few weeks. Um, went to Bournemouth for a few days. I was supposed to go to Germany, but the volcano got in the way. Oh, so, yeah. yeah, lots of research. Um, the question of sexuality certainly is, a, is central to your work. Um, it's hard to know what sort of uh, simplistic or otherwise questions to put to you about this, but um, do you think within the, within the novel, at least, if we stay with that, that there is any difference in, in essence between the, the heterosexual and homosexual in terms of love? Or, or, or is this sort of just some fine tuning or or how, how do you see it as it operates within the novel? It's kind of an exercise for me, in a way, to... I wanted to talk about different sexualities. Um, I wanted to talk about different sexualities, but on the other hand, I also wanted to write a lesbian love story with a happy ending, because I've never read one. <laughs> and that was for me. So, but then I, I think the difference is, is, I think there are a lot of differences, and I wanted to explore them. And I think the, the, the idea of how intimacy is between two men or two women, how intimacy is between a man and a woman, is very different. And I wanted to put them all together and see what, see, you know, what they were like. For myself, I was curious. So. Yeah, well, I found while I was reading, I kept sort of, that question was often to the forefront of my mind, and I, I just began to wonder to you know, there are certain things one can point to, especially in terms of a public self, uh, public sort of pressures, the sort of uh, 
the, the language that circulates around homosexuality and heterosexuality, uh, all, all those things are undoubtedly present, but I, I wondered nevertheless whether there was some notion of essence, and that's a tricky term, but not even very useful, where there is not really such difference in notions of love. There probably is, but love is politicised, and I think you know it has a political and cultural package. So that's inescapable. Yeah, okay. I think that's what I was. Yeah, I think it is. And while I was down having a swim a bit earlier in the day, I had this other thought, which I share. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the extent to which sexuality. Um, in terms of homosexuality, especially perhaps for men, seems to be a key to identity in ways in which it isn't for heterosexual people. Like most people don't sort of define themselves in terms of I'm, I'm heterosexual. I mean, it's, it's sim simply I suppose because that's the dominant mode and there's no need, you're not defining yourself against anything. Mm. It might be like you're a white person in a white society and you don't define yourself as being white. And then it all plays on that. Yeah, I think you hit that on the head there, really. I think it's the notion of the closet, which I wanted to talk about in, in both the contemporary story and in the um, in the Bournemouth story as well. You know, you don't have to negotiate that as a straight person. And it's not just this one thing where you tell the world or you just skyrocket into whatever you do and that's it, it's over. It's a constant negotiation. It's very hard to describe to someone who doesn't have to go through it. You know, um, it's very tricky, and I wanted to kind of un unpack that. And I think you're right. I think it, it, you have to come to terms with the identity, and then you have to negotiate it, and you keep negotiating it. Um, and you don't have to do that if you're the dominant sexuality. I don't think it's about one sexuality being better than the other. It's just that the heterosexual sexuality is the dominant one. So you kind of you don't have to deal with that stuff. So you simply can't avoid that as an aspect of the way you identify. No, I don't think so. Thank you. Look, there's so much more and we're going to run out of time soon. But um, in both works there's a strong presence of artists, writers, musicians. Uh, music is a motif in both. Dreams very much so in Yvette's work as well. Uh, plus a few, uh, quite a few other sort of things that keep repeating. Um, they're a pretty creative mob. Um, Dimitri says to Kathleen, you and I, we live through words, so how we understand the world. John says to David, you told me painting was working the world out, and what follows is an elaborated description of just that. For Ginny, the piano has a special place. When she played the piano, she, Jim felt important, always gathering an imaginary audience around her. Um, so the role of art, the role of creativity, is this... Is simply because you, this is what you reach for because this is the stuff you know, or do you feel that this has got some special place that needs to be foregrounded? Lynn? Well, I, I think that um, it's definitely influenced by my. I mean, I think that um, you know I'm a creative person, so um, I, I think I, it's natural that I bring it, bring it in, bring in music. Um, but are you prepared to sort of think that this is this is not just important because you have? No, I don't even think I even thought about it, whether I should bring it in. I just no. did as a matter of. No, but even on reflection, do you think that there is a sort of a point about creativity that needs to be? But this is this is one of these sort of things, flip things that I was going to do. I happened to get an article sent by Robin and Gary earlier on the uh, the role of um, literary fiction in turning you basically into uh, what I would think was a better person. And this was a bit of scientific research. This wasn't, this wasn't the humanities. This is the scientists saying that you, you, you know, they can actually measure a shift in empathy if you read literary fiction. And if you don't, well, you're buggered. <laughs> <laughs>